Welcome back to Home and Design and the Saturn V flying model rocket build. We've got the parts laid out here on the table. We're also gonna look at the tools and the expendables that are required for this build. Now, the company that developed this amazing kit is called Apogee Components out of Colorado, or Apogee Rockets, I think is their website. Um, owner, Tim Van Milligan, developed a great list of all the things you'll need to build the rocket. So we threw that into a document. We're gonna take a look and see that we're ready to get started. Uh, let's see, I could pull some tools out or I could go for expendables. Why don't I grab a couple trays of what I typically use for model building and see if everything we have is already there or if we're gonna need to go find some things. So let me grab some expendables. All right, it says we're gonna need an, a wood glue, carpenter's glue. Okay, no, here we go. Yeah, we've got some of that ready. Um, says we're gonna need both thin and thick CA glues or cyanoacrylate grills, uh, glues, and we've got a, a number of those. The ones that I'm gonna use on this model almost exclusively though are the, the Bob Industries uh, glues. In our, my career in film, we used uh, some of Zapp's products. I think I still have um, the Zip Kicker accelerant, but I've also got the, the Bob Industries accelerant we're gonna use. These, I think, have all been rebranded for our local hobby shop. Um, I've got some epoxy here too, but let's see what he asked for. Rubber cement and rubber cement thinner. Let's see, we've got rubber cement here. And the thinner, it'll be interesting. I think, I don't think I have rubber cement thinner. I'm gonna acquire some. I was just talking with Kevin, who you know from the podcast, um, and he was telling me that some things that will clearly activate a, at least a portion of rubber cement, like acetone, may uh, be only activating a small portion of that glue, or just some portion of that glue, leaving some behind, and that a thinner developed, especially for rubber cement, might make sure that we're activating all of it. So I think I am gonna go find some of that before uh, comes time to use a rubber cement. Uh, liquid plastic cement, I guess we're talking about model building cement. I've got, uh, got some right here. Super thin stuff that again, we can wick into place. Spray adhesive is required. We've got cans of that up in the door there. We'll see. Once again, I think in the Christmas video, we talked about how spray adhesives are pretty much good for just gluing your arm hair together. Um, We'll see if I absolutely need to use some in this project or if there's any way to avoid it. Uh, epoxy clay. Now, Tim had recommended the Fix It brand. I think I've got uh, the epoxy brand. The packaging is so similar. I wonder if it's the, the same company and if so, which one preceded the other. But I think I've got my parts A and part B here of a good epoxy clay. And, uh, Carpenter's wood filler. We do have some of that here. I don't know, this might be old. It still feels really nice and, and fresh, but this is gonna be used, I think, to fill the seams on our model rocket tubes. That's kind of a pretty standard technique. One of the things I like to use sometimes is just though a, a solvent drying uh, spot putty. And uh, I say I've got um, my applicators here. I like to save old hotel room keys which just make fantastic trowels when you're working on something like this. So, looks like I'm all set to go there. Um, but let's see, we need a permanent marker. And he suggests that the Sharpie brand would be a good brand. However, Sharpie markers sometimes end up looking brown or purple when you write onto something and if this is gonna have a cosmetic effect, uh, this isn't what I was looking for either. Let's see. This is a marker, I think it's by Sakura Permapake, and it really draws a beautiful true black, like a blue black. And it doesn't end up looking uh, purple or brown like a Sharpie. A Sharpie also fades up through your paint, so you would never wanna like actually mark your tubes or do anything with a Sharpie and then like paint our white paint 
over it. And I wouldn't do that with the Permapake either, but I know Sharpies are like brutal offenders. If you ever worked on a sheetrock project with someone who used a Sharpie, that was a big mistake. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, liquid masking medium. Uh, and he suggests microscale, which is what I have. And I've got a couple of micros microscales products here. I've got some decal uh, applicators here, which could be helpful on this project as well. If I think these are water slides, so we'll probably be getting into that. And then I've got um, microscales micro mask. And so we'll be using that. I have a feeling when it comes time to start cutting our lines when we put the, the black and white checkerboard pattern on our rocket and it crosses all of this fine detail. We're gonna wanna try and do that with some liquid mask. In addition to tape, I'm sure tape is on Tim's list here. Yeah, masking tape and transparent tape. I don't know what he wants transparent tape for. Maybe I have to read a line under the tape. If it's some other kind of temporary adhesion, I'll probably use blue painter's tape. Um, speaking in a masking tape, I do have my fine detail uh, modeling tapes here that'll be great for cutting in my line. And then I'll follow behind with blue painter's tape and uh, just tape right up to that so that I can cover larger surface areas at a much lower price than these modeling tapes. All right, now we're, we're into tools. So let me straighten up here a little bit and we'll take a look at the tools that are required for the job. All right, looking at the tools, um, the first item Tim suggests is a pencil, which of course we have. Next would be a ruler. Now, I've got spares here, uh, including the metal one he recommends. Um, I'm noticing now, I see in here, I've got a cloth tape, which can be helpful, of course, for measuring around a tube. So maybe we'll see if that comes in to play as well. Uh, an aluminum angle. Now, um, I, I figured that would be high on the list here because an aluminum angle is the ruler for model rocket builders, and, and I'll show you why. Okay. When you try to measure something on a rocket tube, if you try to use a ruler, it's very difficult to know if you've oriented yourself on the surface. But when you want to mark a tube, if you use an angle, it self-centers itself on the tube and you can easily mark a tube. And even a small angle like this works really well on any diameter. It immediately finds true north that you can move it around the tube and make markings, transfer lines all the way from one end to the other if you had fins and let's say canards or something. A uh, sanding block. I can uh, fine sanding and the fine adhesives drawer. I also happen to have a large scale sanding device. I think all my papers are nearby. I wonder if this block is going to be rigid enough to do everything Tim wants us to do, but I think it will be. All right. Small and large paint brushes. We've got buckets of chip brushes and artist brushes. I'll get those when we need them. A hobby knife with lots of new replacement blades, Tim says, and I couldn't agree more. Let's go to our sharps drawer here and find, let's see, we've got a couple different things going here, but here's my favorite. Right now, this body I'm using, it's kind of, it's thicker than a lot of brands, standard number 11 um, tool. I like this one, it happens to be by Fiskars. It's got a great weight to it. Um, the silicone overmold on the grips has deteriorated and I just wrapped it with some gaffer's tape. So this is my go-to. And my blades. If you're a modeler, you should be buying blades 100 at a time because when you're doing something like cutting this vacuform right here, you almost want a new blade every time you go to the sheet uh, so that you know you can make very fine cuts without accidentally tugging on or drawing any of the material or cracking it. So uh, we'll be using a lot of new blades and uh, always keeping our eye. I know graphic designers, I'm from back in the days of uh, paste ups and uh, um, 
you'd have whole mason jars full of exacto blades on everybody's desk and so we've got our blades and our blade disposal ready to go there's almost nothing i can't do with a number 11 blade once you spend a lot of time with this suddenly it's a trowel suddenly you're drilling with it suddenly uh, whatever you've done something to yourself and now you have a, a medical instrument to do a little bit of a first aid on set here so all right moving on um, a wooden stick to apply glue I think this is a chopstick it'll be perfect for applying glue on this model if we need to cuticle scissors with a curved tip important for cutting out the vacuform fairings. He's talking about these right here. And there must be something about the compound form that's gonna make it easier to cut with cuticle scissors. So back in the sharps drawer, I'm sure we've got something like that. Here we go, so that's how to do the trick. We'll find out more when we get to that stage. A large paper clasp used to hold balsa parts together while gluing. I think he means like a paper clip um, is what I might call it. And we certainly have those. We use them for painting a lot. We'll sometimes hang things up that we're spray painting. We'll sometimes uh, use it to hold a tarp onto something or whatever, but I've got large clasps. That's what he says, large clasps. But we've got tons of medium size and fine clasps as well, and we'll see, we'll see what that's for. Sponge-backed sanding pads. Now, this makes me curious. I'd love to know what the recommendation, it says optional here on the list. If, let's just pretend for a moment, if this were a sponge, and one of the things we wanna do is sand this tube, the construction of a sanding sponge is open on one side and closed on the others. And it's gonna be a very dangerous tool for something as fragile as this cardboard. You would wanna make sure that the open ends were always pointing along the length of the tube so that the sponge conformed to the tube on that open side. If you tried sanding across your rocket and these closed corners could really cut your rocket in just a heartbeat before you knew it. So uh, in the case of maybe using a sanding sponge on this tube, I'd probably just prefer sandpaper and all the uh, tactile feedback I would get. I'd wanna know where everything is and use my hands to conform to the tube. So. We'll see though, we have, we've got some of those over in a, a sheetrock or drywall bin on the other side of the shop. And uh, if it comes to that, we'll use a sponge back sand, sanding pad. Uh, diagonal wire cutters, I think uh, we're talking about cutting out our, our plastic parts. Although these are just about to fall right off the sprue. And I can tell by the way they're attached, that happens at a place that's not important. Meaning a little sprue could stay with the part a little part could stay with the sprue, and I don't particularly care, but we can use our, our clippers to, to get those parts off. Uh, that's good practice. Um, let's see, oh, tools, here we go. Yeah, this is an uh, Italian-made set of clippers called CHP brand. I normally have uh, several pairs of Exolite clippers at my soldering station, but um, these I think are a little more precise and and uh, they're gonna be perfect for releasing these parts. So, we've got our clippers here. Finally, some single-edged razor blades. In addition to our X-Acto knives, we just want some blades. And I wonder if they're gonna need to go into a scraper tool or just used by hand, but surely we've got Razor blades till the cows come home. Don't see the release here. There we go. So we're ready with these. And we'll wait to find out what part of the rocket that single edge razor blades play a role in. 
that does it for us. I think we're in pretty good shape. We only need to find uh, some rubber cement thinner, some rubbing alcohol, which I know we have here. And uh, I think it's time to get to get started. I think um, one of the things I can do just to clean up the uh, desk a little bit is to finish cutting out some of these parts and organizing them a little differently. So I'll cut out these parts of the F1 engine. Now it'll be exciting to see test fit two of them here together. Recognize this? Mm -hmm. There we go. Yeah, I'm wearing uh, Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. I'm wearing his awesome F1 engine shirt. I'll put a link to the shirt in the video, but we'll get all our F1 engines prepared here. This is the last one, so here we go. All right. All right, there we go. I like to keep my parts organized on the table, and I have all sorts of organizational tools for doing that. So let's see. Being white parts, I think I'll look for a dark-colored storage container to put them in on the desktop until we get around to actually gluing them together. Let's go over here. All right, found some, always saving all the trays that different things come in because they make great organizational uh, items. So I've got our F1 engine parts stored here. Okay, I've dug into things a little bit here and taken some of those parts we punched out and all those are simply wood glued, uh, cardboard parts to cardboard parts. So these great laser cut part sheets they gave us that we punched out have now been combined into some of the parts. This is one of the motor mount spacers and you can see I've already glued one to the uh, motor mount tube and we'll glue, glue the other one in now and that'll help center the part in the main tube. So we just simply use some wood glue for that. All right, once we're happy with the placement of this at the end of the motor mount tube, we'll go ahead and we'll add glue fillets along the other side as well. see one quick thing we can wrap up I've been gluing some of the uh, F1 engine parts together just with uh, model cement and I've got the final two pieces here ready to go there's nothing too special about it these parts didn't require any cleanup they look real good I did a little cleanup on the inside of some uh, casting artifacts and I may sand those a little bit late a little bit more before I paint these but in terms of assembling these I think we're ready to go and some modeling cement is the right thing for the job, so.
too much cement can can kind of melt and deform this plastic. So I'm doing I'm using too much cement on purpose, but in an area that I know is gonna actually be smoothed out by the excess of glue. Speaking of engines, we've been cutting out some of these vacuform wraps, which are awesome. Um, Tim Van Milligan recommended in his instructions that you use a cuticle scissors to cut out some of these shapes, especially for this part. And I think that's true. I'm not thrilled with my scissors for one, but also it has been very difficult to figure out where to cut these parts. And so far that's the only thing where uh, I've been frustrated at even you know, with some experience and skill and the right tool, the recommended tool, um, it can be difficult to figure out where to cut these parts. The base of this fairing that I'm cutting now is one of the easiest. There is kind of a, a ridge to guide you and um, you can cut those and then even afterwards, I can get a pretty clear picture of where I wanna come back and clean something up or tighten it up. But as I try to cut the straight line along the edge of the fairing here, it's very difficult to know, to see the corner I'm cutting into. And after it's done, you come back and I see there's a little bit of visual flange on it, and that's what we don't want. So at least these scissors are precise enough for me to come back and make tiny, adjustments and clean up the part. But I've nev never been too satisfied with the way that's turning out. Now, one of the things I will say is that when we join these fairings to the parts that they're meant to go with, they actually look wonderful. And uh, where, where they join is not gonna be a problem. It's also recommended that we use some modeling putty in that joint and that's going to absolutely conceal any of the things that were, were bothering me as I cut it out. So um, it's, they, they actually work quite well. Looks like one of the next things we can do is build the support member that's meant to go under these fairings or cowlings, whatever we want to call them. And uh, that creates the strength for that part so when it comes down and uh, lands it'll hopefully be protected. It's just uh, the, the grain it just falls apart. It's nice and then the cross grain. Okay, this little sub assembly is as simple as laminating a few of these parts together like so and that leaves room for one of the plastic fins to come in and be inserted later. And so we're just gonna spread glue around on these balsa parts and glue them up so that we can come back and slide a fit in. Okay, one thing we can do now is install the motor mount, which is this little guy right here. And he goes in this end of the rocket where the motor's installed. Motor's installed like this. And now this motor has a flange on it, so it'll lift the whole rocket by that flange, actually, but many motors don't have a flange like that. And you install this motor mount so that the motor is pushing against that mount, really lifting the entire rocket from this one little part right here. So we'll install it anyway, because we may buy motors in the future and fly the rocket that will require the mount. So the way we want to apply our glue deep into the tube is to find a, an appropriate applicator and uh, our glue. And we're gonna find out how deep we want to insert this applicator into the motor mount tube. We'll see just how deep in to the rocket we want to insert uh, glue into the motor mount tube. So whoop, we'll get it on here. We'll rotate it. There we go. And 
stir some of that around in the tube. Let's make sure I have a good distance on that. That might have been a little deep. That's a lot of glue. So try and be a little more precise this time. engine to set it to the proper depth. I can feel it engaging the glue there. And we're good. Make sure I didn't get any residue on our motor. So that mounts in there and I am curious to know how much of a bead of glue was pushed out in front of that motor mount but it looks really sharp. So I'm pleased with what we're doing here. I don't see any glue uh, obstructing the tube and really the only thing we have is the ejection charge blasting forward of the top of that motor mount and there's plenty of room for it to do that. Come out here and push the front half of the rocket off and deploy our parachutes. So I think we're good there. We'll let this dry on its side so the motor mount doesn't start sliding down the tube. Okay. Next, we should go ahead and make our thrust rings. And kind of like the motor mount, we transfer all that energy. Uh, the motor mount trans transfers the energy to this tube. This tube transfers the energy to these spacers. And these spacers will be uh, transferring the energy to the main tube. And wherever we do that, we want to install a thrust ring. Now, this tubing is available in standard sizes. So our thrust ring, is the same diameter as our main tube. But we want this thrust ring to fit inside the tube. And this is how we do that. We go ahead and cut one of our rings. And I'm just gonna kind of eyeball what we're doing here. I can even, I could make this an angled cut and, and it would all still kind of work out. But I'd prefer to make a pretty parallel cut if I can. And Missing my exacto blade for the moment, but this will do. Okay. We'll fit this ring now into the tube. Find out where a good fit is, and we'll push out on the ring tightly so that it fills the space nicely and everything is seated just like it should be in real life. We'll come in and mark our thrust ring there. Now we'll cut off that small part. I'm rotating my ring just to make sure that there was no glue coming out the back side of that seam and we're gluing this thrust ring to our main tube before we're ready. It's going to be recessed in a little deeper down where this spacer ring is positioned. But there's one of our two thrust strings uh, built there. Next time uh, we're with you, um, we'll have moved on to some of our vacuform wraps. We've got to trim some of these so that they're ready to bend around the circumference of the rocket. And we apply those with uh, our CA glue. We've got some special 
odorless CA glue, which is gonna be safe for the vacuform plastics. And we've got some very precise applicator tips that will just wick a very small amount of CA glue right under the vacuforms and adhere those to the tubes. And uh, we'll do that next time here at Home and Design.